uh, welcome to this webinar on the terror threat in the United Kingdom from Syria to loan actors by my colleague, Mr. Raffaello Pantucci, who is visiting senior fellow at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Let me introduce myself. I am Associate Professor Kumar Ramakrishna. I'm Associate Dean for Policy Studies and Head of the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research at RSIS. Let me tell you a bit about the webinar uh, this morning. It is 15 years since the UK was hit by the Al-Qaeda directed July 7, 2005 attack on London's public transport system. And the terrorist threat that the country faces has evolved dramatically. Rather than mostly network plots directed by Al-Qaeda, the threat picture is now dominated by lone actors using knives and fake bombs, while the ideological picture has become confused and fluid. Drawing on data from successful and disrupted plots, Raffaello Pantucci will sketch out what the threat picture has looked like since the beginning of the conflict in Syria, highlighting its evolution through an analysis of terrorist attack planning. The discussion will try to draw out some of the current trends while also asking questions about how the threat picture might be evolving. Allow me to share a bit more information on our speaker today. Raffaello Pantucci, is a visiting senior fellow at the Terrorism Center in RSIS, ICPVTR. He is also a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute or RUSI in London, where he served previously as the Director of International Security Studies. Prior to joining RUSI in 2013, Raf lived for almost four years in Shanghai, where he was a visiting scholar at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. He has held positions at the International Institute for Strategic Studies or IISS in London, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS in Washington, DC, the European Council of Foreign Relations, and the International Center for the Study of Radicalization in King's College, London. Raf is the author of the well-received book, We Love Death as You Love Life, Britain's Suburban Terrorists, published by Hearst and Oxford University Press in 2015. Raf's work has been cited in the UK's Counter-Terrorism Strategy Contest, and his work has appeared in many international peer-reviewed journals and leading newspapers, such as the New York Times, Financial Times, and the Wall Street Journal, amongst other outlets. Before we begin, can I have a request? Uh, when you post your questions, please use the chat box on Zoom to post uh, your queries. I will look at them and convey them to Raf. Also, uh, please switch off your video and audio so we can all focus on the speaker. So with that, let me just pass the time to my colleague, Raf. Raf, please. Hi, uh, Kumar. Thank you for that generous introduction and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this webinar. Um, I am grateful that you've all chosen to join. Now, I'm going to put up my PowerPoint now, which means we're going to have a slight delay and I apologize in advance because this is just how these things are. So, um, again, thank you for the invitation to speak to you and thank you for joining me on a, on a morning. I mean, as I, uh, I chose this date for a rather specific reason, which is that it is exactly 15 years now since the United Kingdom faced um, the terrorist attack, the terrorist atrocity of 2005, where four individuals, uh, linked to Al-Qaeda, uh, launched a suicide attack on Britain's, on London's public transport system, murdering 52 people as they went about their business. And what's interesting, I think, is to really think about the UK terror threat picture through that lens and to sort of think about how far we've come in these past 15 years uh, from a threat that was very clearly linked to networks abroad that were directing people who were receiving training and being sent back with specific instruction to launch terrorist attacks. We're now in a very different situation where you may remember um, a short, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a stabbing in a park in London, in Reading, where an individual who again appears to have some sort of links to uh, the sort of broader terror threat picture, who appeared to have links to the battlefield in Syria, launched a kind of one man stabbing attack on people as they were enjoying a pint in the park on one of the few days that London's opened up after uh, the current sort of coronavirus um, chaos. So I think the point is we've really evolved over those 15 years. And what I wanted to try to do in this presentation was try to talk about this threat and how it's evolved specifically through the lens of the plots that we've seen since the war in Syria broke out. 
And that terror threat picture, I think, is nicely articulated. The sort of journey I want to take us through on this presentation is articulated in some ways through these three attacks that I show here on the screen, um, or these three incidents that I show through here on the screen. On the far left of your screen, there is an individual called Errol Incidal, who kind of, whose plot marks the first of the plots that I talk about within the uh, threat picture that I'm talking about in this uh, presentation, the data set I've drawn together. Um, Errol Incidal was an individual who went in sort of the early days of the conflict in Syria from the United Kingdom out to the battlefield, uh, managed to get to some training camps on the borders of Turkey and Syria, connected with people there, whether they were linked to ISIS or Al-Qaeda has never been made entirely clear. But at the time, if we think about it in 2012, 2013, when this was, it would have been before the ISIS uh, split had sort of emerged. So in fact, that narrative would have been very fluid at the time. He's an individual who had links to the terror threat picture in the United Kingdom. He'd been connected to uh, some of the children of Abu Hamza, the hook-handed cleric who might, many might remember as a very infamous figure in this sort of British jihadist scene. Um, he was a kind of long-standing figure and part of that community. And he came back in 2013 uh, with, uh, as has been, you know, declared, as was uh, presented in the case against him, as was seen in the case, he actually wasn't prosecuted ultimately for some of these charges. His case is a very difficult and opaque one to talk about. But principally, the idea was that he was talking to people in Syria who'd sent him back with a specific attack plan that he was meant to launch in the United Kingdom. And we take that from 2013 all the way through to more recently. So the two incidents I've highlighted here, the one on the top is uh, the shooting of uh, Sudesh Aman, uh, a young man who'd just been released from prison a uh, short uh, week, I think, before this, who was walking down Stratham High Street with a fake bomb on, uh, went into a shop, bought some knives, and then started ran running into the crowds around him. He was being trailed by armed police officers because the security service was very worried about his case when he came out of prison. And they shot him down before he was able to do too much damage. And he only managed to wound two people or three people before he was stopped. Um, you know, this was the last sort of successful attack prior to the Reading one that we'd seen in the United Kingdom. And then underneath, we have the case of Safiya Sheikh, uh, a young woman who back in 2007 converted, um, and then by about 2014-15 seems to radicalize to quite an extreme degree. She's a former drug addict, a person from a very mixed background, who was running kind of online communities and forums, and was just prosecuted the other day for agreeing to be part of a terrorist plot to detonate a bomb which she was going to carry under St. Paul's Cathedral in London. So this is how the terror threat pictures evolved. Neither of these two attacks I'm talking about on the right are ones that have any demonstrable, real clear link with sort of attack planning or directing from abroad with ISIS or Al-Qaeda or other organizations. They were talking to people, but as I'll come to a little bit later, the nature, of which, the nature in which they were talking to people was very confused. They were sort of part of online communities of radical groups that were there. But it seems as though, you know, in the case of Safiya Sheikh, she was ultimately prosecuted uh, on the basis of a case that was assembled because she was talking to undercover agents online. She was also talking to people in other European countries who, in some cases, it seemed as though she was trying to direct them to do plots. In other cases, she seemed to be helping them uh, undertake their plots. But the direct link to ISIS or Al-Qaeda or other groups is very difficult to see. And this very much characterizes the terror threat picture that we see in the United Kingdom at the moment. So I think this is the journey I'm talking about within this from kind of plots with clear links and direction from the battlefield of some sort, even though it's actually quite opaque in this particular case, all the way through to cases that we're talking about here uh, in Stratton or in the case of Safi Sheikh or even the Reading one, which I, I purposely didn't mention. I didn't put up the picture and mention his name because, of course, the individual is currently undergoing trial. So we have still to see that fully play out. Now, the data set I've tried to assemble uh, draws on uh, 43 plots that I've identified since October 2013 when Errol Incidal was stopped, um, all the way through to June 20th of this year where we had the incident in Reading. Um, we're talking about 43 plots in total, which involves a total of 70 individuals. Uh, that makes up 10 women uh, and 60 men. Um, if we think about the actual attacks, the successful attacks that have taken place, there's 13 that I'm able to track in this data set. It's worth highlighting that actually these numbers don't totally accord with the official numbers that we see being uh, talked about by uh, the security services or the police. When we see sort of Neil Basu or Cressida Dick, the sort of senior police officer in the United Kingdom, or even Andrew Parker talking about the terror threat picture, the numbers they talk about often are a bit higher. 
but it's very difficult because ultimately the information I try to draw on is based on information I'm able to ascertain either from the public domain or from access to court documents and records. Um, and I try to focus on plots where there's a very clear evidence of an attack being attempted or an attack successfully being perpetrated um, rather than some of the other plots where we see individuals who are being prosecuted for different crimes, uh, but where it's not actually clear what the actual plot undertaken was. So for example, uh, the case of uh, Suda Shaman is quite an interesting one in this regard. Suda Shaman might be a case that the security service and police would consider as someone who tried to do an attack, was arrested for it, and then ultimately did perpetrate an attack. Um, I, would, I haven't counted his earlier incident as an attack because ultimately he was prosecuted for possession of material and talking to other people online. And when he was arrested, it really wasn't very clear that he was actually planning to do an attack. He talked about something online, but there's no evidence that he'd taken any steps towards actually doing something. So I think this will help explain why, if you were to go back and look at the numbers that are quoted here versus the numbers that we see senior security sources talking about, they don't always match up. But it's very difficult to know exactly what they count as, uh, as a sort of plot with uh, intent to kill versus what I have tried to include. I've tried to base myself on the sort of open information. Anyway, the uh, networks that we're talking about, I mean, if we look at sort of how these uh, plots are spread out over the time period um, allocated, we're basically talking about five a year, roughly five a year, with a big spike in 2017, uh, where we actually had five successful attacks. Uh, well, four successful Islamist attacks and one uh, by, well, five successful Islamist attacks in many ways. Um, and then we had a real spike in arrest. So of course, the numbers in 2017 might be biased by that fact, uh, by the fact that security services at that point were sort of much more concerned about what was happening. And so really clamped down a lot of plots much earlier, maybe than they would have before, because they were very worried about the threat picture. So that might explain why we have this spike. But otherwise, we have a broad pattern of about five across the year. If we look at the average age um, at time of arrest or at time of launch of the attack, it's 24.4 in total, uh, which averages out at about the males around 24.5 and the female 26. So not much variance there. Basically, we're seeing people in their mid 20s uh, involved in these attacks. Um, if we think about the sort of upper end of the range and the lower end of the range, the youngest is 14, the oldest is 52. Um, and actually, these numbers track quite tidily with other uh, pieces of research that have been done, specifically Hannah Stewart, who's done a lot of research looking at kind of the terror threat picture in the United Kingdom. And this basically matches the numbers that she has for uh, her terrorist threat picture, uh, which maps out all of the individuals involved, not just those involved in attack planning or actual attacks, which is what I'm focused on. So basically those numbers are, you know, pretty matching with the sort of broader patterns. If we look at how the attack numbers matches up with what we've seen previously, um, another piece of research that I did, and here wonderfully I can sort of show people the book. If you would like to look inside this book, you'll find um, it, was, it has a chapter by me where I tried to look at the sort of historical threat picture of attack planning in the United Kingdom. And in that I'd identified sort of four different stages. The first stage from 98 to 2004, where basically the United Kingdom was kind of a place from which we saw AQ launching attacks elsewhere. Um, and then we had about seven plots undertaken uh, from 2004 to 2009, where really the attack uh, target becomes the United Kingdom. Um, we see 15 plots undertaken with links back to, so a lot of them with links back to AQ, uh, but also some beyond, uh, some sort of lone actor starts to pop up during that period as well. And then from 2009 to 2013, where we really see the core AQ threat from Afghanistan, Pakistan receding, and instead it gets filled up with sort of threat picture coming very heavily from AQAP in Yemen, but we also see more lone actor plots but we see individuals launching all sorts of other attack planning, and that's where we see 15 plots. So looking at this period that we're talking about, which is from 2013 to 2020 now, we're talking about 43 plots. So we're talking about a real increase in terms of the number of attacks taking place. Um, I'll briefly mention the fact that, of course, while I'm not focused on it in this particular uh, presentation, there is an extreme right-wing threat that goes really, I would argue, throughout this entire period. It gets a lot more attention now, and it's become, it's described as the fastest growing side of the threat. But when you dig down into the numbers, actually, um, you know, when you look at, for example, what Neil Basu, the senior British cop uh, responsible for counterterrorism, when he talks about uh, terrorist planning, um, he says that his officers see more extreme right wing planning as uh, it's the most growing part of the picture they look at, but it still only accounts for 10% of the workload that they're focused on, with 90% still really focused on uh, Islamists and others. Um, so while we've seen consistently sort of attacks from the right, and that goes back to 
I'm sorry, I realize there's a typo here. It should say David Copeland back in 1999, uh, where he launched a one-man campaign. We had an attack in 2013. We had an attack in 2016. We had attacks in 2017. You know, we've had a sort of consistent loan actor threat picture, but it's very much more about loan actors throughout. So it's been extreme right-wing plotters doing loan actor plots. We can talk, I can talk a bit more about that if people are interested. There is the organized group National Action, which has emerged in the past few years, uh, in 2013-14, uh, which offers a more worrying kind of uh, side to that picture. But, you know, I would argue the extreme right-wing threat has basically been a constant presence that more recently has become sort of more worrying uh, for other exogenous reasons. But it's not what I'm focusing on here. But the trends in some way on the extreme right, interestingly, go in some ways in the opposite direction to the one that we've seen with the lone actors. So now to focus specifically on the serious side of the picture. Um, and the serious side of the picture is interesting because it's very unclear um, to the degree to which we've really seen directed plots uh, from Syria or ISIS or Al Qaeda back to the United Kingdom. In terms of plots directed and sent, there really are only two that are identifiable. And in both of those cases, it's actually very unclear uh, what uh, the connection and direction from Syria actually was. In one case, we have a case in 2014 of a chap called Tariq Hassan who traveled to Syria uh, through Sudan. Um, he was connected to the sort of broader community around jihad, the famous jihadi John, Mohammed Mwazi. Um, and some of the other famous Beatles uh, have subsequently said from their Kurdish detention that they were involved in helping direct the attack that he was planning where him and some of his friends were getting their hands on some guns and were trying to uh, basically shoot uh, police officers uh, on Lon around London using a moped. They were going to sort of drive around, shoot these guys, um, you know, and this was going to be kind of their, their attack. Um, but the degree to which he was being directed from Syria is very unclear. The degree to which he was sent back to launch this attack is also a bit unclear, but it seems very um, highly likely. Um, similarly, Errol Insidal, who I mentioned before, Again, he came back from the battlefield in Syria. He appears to have been talking to someone there about maybe doing an attack. But again, the degree of direction is actually very opaque. So if we're looking across this uh, attack picture of 43 plots, since we've seen the war in Syria really take off, um, it's very unclear the degree to which we've seen security forces disrupting uh, plots with very clear sorts of direction from the battlefield. Um, and as I say, there's really only two plots that we can see. And in fact, in both of those plots, they were actually disrupted. It's worth noting that, you know, when we look beyond, uh, uh, you know, this uh, particular group, one of the, of course, successful attacks that we've seen in the United Kingdom in 2017, the murder in Manchester of uh, 22 uh, children and, and family members as they were leaving uh, um, an Ariana Grande concert by Salman Abedi, you know, that was, uh, uh, it's the most successful attack that we can see within this period, successful, marked by the uh, sad number of people murdered in the incident. Um, in that particular case, it's not clear the degree that Salman Abedi went to the battlefield in Syria, but it is very likely. Um, but it is very clear that he did go and participate in the conflict in Libya. And the degree to which he may have been directed off the battlefield in Libya, again, is very unclear. There's an inquest which was meant to happen this year, but has now, I think, been postponed to later this year or early next, where hopefully we'll get some clarity around this. But at the moment, it's not very clear the degree to which he was directed. But if he was, it wasn't from Syria which I think highlights the degree to which, you know, there's been a lot of concern around the battlefield in Syria and direction by these groups, but it hasn't seemed to articulate itself, ultimately, the sharp end of, uh, of the plots that we've seen. Having said that, there is a lot of conversation happening back and forth between fighters in Syria, uh, most of them linked to ISIS, and people in the United Kingdom who ultimately try to launch attacks. Um, and that I can track in about 20 cases. And this is everything from cases like people talking to people like Junaid Hussain and Omar Hussain, who are two sort of prominent British jihadis, Jihad, Junaid Hussain in particular, who's a very prominent sort of uh, hacker, uh, former hacker from Birmingham, who ran off to the battlefield in Syria in, uh, I think it was 2012 or 13, um, who became a very prominent figure um, because he was linked to numerous plots around the world. And he's really kind of the poster boy for what people call remote direction from the battle in Syria, where he was talking to fighters, talking to people around the world, in some cases, giving them quite specific direction about what they should do, talking them through the attack plans they should do. In other cases, linking them up with other people. Um, in other cases, uh, he was actually sort of collecting information, using friends who are hackers to gather information, to then publish details, for example, of people linked to the American military. 
offering lone actors a potential target that they, they, they can go for. Junaid Hussain was a Brit. Um, he was killed by a drone strike in 2015. Um, he was talking, I could identify links to at least five of the cases in the United Kingdom. I'm sorry, three uh, to Junaid Hussain and two to Omar Hussain, who's another quite similar figure to Junaid Hussain, but maybe without the notoriety uh, that we saw with him. We also have an interesting phenomenon of, in at least five cases, it's identifiable that individuals involved in attack planning were linked to, had family members who died in Syria. In some cases, fighting alongside ISIS. In some cases, just dying in Syria. Um, and this is an interesting kind of wrinkle, which I think is worth exploring a little bit more because it adds a kind of revenge motive in some of these attacks. Um, and then in terms of links to ISIS, again, and again here, the point I'm emphasizing is links doesn't necessarily mean direction. Even in the case where people are talking to Junaid Hussain and Omar Hussain, in the UK cases, it's again, it's not entirely clear the degree to which they were directing people to launch the attacks rather than they were talking to people. Uh, you know, nowadays with these communications apps that we all have and we can all stay in touch with each other, it's very easy to sort of be in contact. And so in a lot of cases, we see lots of chatter going back and forth. And that extends to these ISIS links, which we see in about 16 plots. The other interesting question is travelers, uh, people traveling to uh, foreign battlefields, which of course is often focused on as one of the great concerns of a battlefield like Syria. Well, what's interesting is actually when we dig into it, if we look at the 43 plots, um, there's only identifiable travelers, clearly identifiable travelers in five plots. And only two of those really have connections to Syria in particular. Um, and of those travelers, actually the two uh, uh, successful plots are ones that don't have links to individuals who travel to Syria. Again, Abedi is a sort of confusing uh, side of this picture where there is some the hints that he might have traveled to Syria from Libya, but there's not been any sort of absolute clarity around that yet. Um, but again, it emphasizes the fact that really when we're talking about travelers, we need to think about it in a much sort of broader conception than just worrying about the single battlefield. Um, the other interesting thing to note is actually only two of these uh, attacks, only two of these travelers ended up in attacks. And the other interesting aspect to think about within this sort of traveler, this sort of traveler subset is actually that when we look at these, uh, uh, these travelers uh, to the battlefield, the sort of successful travelers, if you will, in almost every single incident, with the exception of Salman Abedi, they actually try to launch their terrorist attack alone. So these are not people coming back to set up large networks and then try to launch an attack. In a lot of cases, they're actually individuals coming back to then ultimately do the attack by themselves which I think offers us an interesting thing to think about when we're thinking about travelers as points of concern. On the other side of the coin, there has of course been a great deal of concern around the phenomenon of block travelers, i.e. people who were trying to go to battlefields, but failed to. Um, and there's a concern that individuals like this, of course, are people who will be, you know, they're frustrated. They can't achieve their goal of trying to get to a foreign battlefield, and so they stay at home. And what do they do? Well, in seven cases, we see that they try to launch attacks. Uh, they try to plot. And in only one case do we see a successful attack. Um, and that is in the case of Karam Butt, who launched with two uh, uh, companions, um, an attack on first London Bridge and then Borough Market in 2017, um, at around the time of our election that year in June. So, you know, again, there, the question around block travel is an interesting one to dig into because in all of these cases, we can see that these individuals uh, had their passports taken but they weren't actually prosecuted for uh, their attempt to travel. Um, it's interesting uh, to observe this. Now, the question then becomes, you know, do we need to worry more about these block travelers? Well, the other side to this question is we don't know how many block travelers there are out there. Um, there's probably a lot more that we've seen than the, this particular number. But then if we flip it around and look at the passport stripping aspect of it, side of it, there have been somewhere in the region of 100 individuals who, at least 100, if not more, I think it's 100 and something now, who've had their sort of passports removed, uh, who are linked to the sort of conflict in Syria. So even if we think about those two metrics, we can see, you know, that it's not totally clear that block travel necessarily equates absolutely to an attempted attack. But it certainly is something which is a point of concern and worth sort of thinking about. The other aspect which is worth, uh, which I tried to dig into when we're trying to think about the Syria connection, a lot has been made in other studies looking at the question of Muhammad al adnanis famous fatwa from uh, late 2014, uh, where he talked about uh, attacking the disbelievers wherever you could find them using any weapon at hand. And this was really a, a fatwa which sort of, or a speech that rattled through, electrified the sort of jihadist community internationally. And we see a lot more 
all kind of chatter and discussion around attacks after that. Now, again, within the United Kingdom, we do see that as well. But what's interesting is actually, I would argue that within the United Kingdom, it's very difficult to discern an absolute change before and after the fatwa. Before the fatwa, we'd seen stabbing attacks. We'd seen the kind of random targeting plotting going on already. Um, and afterwards, the only discernible thing I can, I can see that's new is that from earlier where people tended to focus on targeting official targets, so when they were talking about doing some of these stabbing plots or some of these attacks, it was very much targeting security officials or others. After the Ed Nani Fatwa, it becomes very difficult to discern exactly what the attack target's going to look like. It's a really random set of things. We see all sorts of plots from, for example, Safiya Sheikh's decision to try to target St. Paul's Cathedral to him attack where he just sort of stabbed people in the streets, all the way through to still, for example, Niamur Rahman's plot um, to try to blow himself up and launch a, a, an attack on Downing Street and murder the prime minister. So it's not totally clear. That's the only sort of discernible thing I can notice if I'm trying to separate out what happens before and after the fatwa. The other thing that's interesting is if we look at it, the clear ISIS links in this, in this data set stops in April 2018 but we still have a number of plots that happen after that. So that kind of gives you some sense of uh, the Syria um, connection. Um, now, I think the interesting aspect I also wanted to dig into within this sort of Syria connection um, and pull out a little bit more and talk about in a little more detail is this question of remote direction. Now, as I mentioned, a lot is made of remote direction and people like Junaid Hussein and Omar Hussein directing people from the battlefield. But what's interesting within uh, this uh, data set of 43 plots is actually the degree to which we can see individuals in the United Kingdom linked to plots abroad where they seem to be directing people elsewhere. In some cases, they have links to the battlefield, but in other cases, they do not. But in all of these cases, we've got people in the United Kingdom who are basically directing plotters abroad. Safiya Sheikh, who I mentioned at the outset, she was the, she's an example of a case who was trying to um, direct uh, people uh, she was talking to people in Norway. She was talking to people in, um, in, uh, in Holland. Uh, she was talking to people who were actually uh, planning to do attacks in, uh, or talking about doing attacks in other European countries and even potentially helping them. And here in this, on this sort of slide, I show three of these cases, which I think show this rather uh, confused picture. On the far left, we have the case of uh, Fatah uh, Mohammed who is a, a Kurdish, um, a Kurdish Iraqi uh, who was living in the United Kingdom, who was talking to some chaps in Germany um, about doing an attack there and actually was sending the materials to do it. Um, uh, ja, uh, ka, uh, we, have a, ka, um, we have the case of um, Nuhur of Qazi Islam sitting up in the top corner, who is an individual who was a young teenage boy who was talking to people who were launching an attack in... Um, who was talking to some of his schoolmates in the United Kingdom about, apologies, I have to turn this off. Um, who was talking to people uh, in, <laughs> apologies for that, it's one of the problems, of course, of this uh, whole system, I found it's all gone out. Um, anyway, uh, young, um, uh, young uh, Mohammed Islam was a young man who was talking to some of his schoolmates and was actually trying to radicalize one of his schoolmates into launching a terrorist attack. He, had, um, he was uh, talking to this young chap, uh, one of his schoolmates, who, uh, you know, the interesting feature about his plot was that while they were chattering online, he was trying to sort of direct him, remote direct him to do a bombing uh, campaign against some soldiers. Um, and while he was talking to um, his schoolmate, his schoolmate was trying to say, well, you know, how do we, you know, what's the code we got to be talking about, about doing this plot? And he goes, well, you know, um, is the cake ready? And he goes, oh, by cake, do you mean bomb? You know, so not a very sort of sophisticated plot, but he was directing one of his teenage schoolmates to actually launch an attack. So at the bottom, where we have the case of an anonymous 14-year-old called RXG, um, who was directing uh, the chap who we can see in the, in the bottom corner, who's sort of doing the, uh, the pointing, uh, the, the oneness uh, image uh, that we see people doing, is a chap called Sebdet Besim, who was going to launch an attack on uh, Anzac Day Parade in, um, in Australia. 
Um, and RxG was talking to fighters in Syria. Um, he was talking to a very prominent uh, Australian fighter called Neil Prakash. Neil Prakash connected him with Sevdet Besim as well as some others. And he was sort of telling these people, why don't you do an attack? And he was really stirring them on. And you can look through all the sort of chatter and you can see that they're really directing. So this idea of remote direction, I think the habit has been to consider it as something that comes off the battlefield in Syria. What's interesting within uh, the sort of uh, the subset I'm talking about is you can see at least five or six plots where we've got people doing remote direction in other uh, contexts um, around Europe or around the world. Um, I also briefly want to touch about, um, on the group Al Mahajarun, which is sort of repeatedly mentioned within, um, within the sort of UK context. And I'm aware I'm getting to about half an hour and don't worry, I'm going to talk for about another five or so minutes before I'll open it up to Q&A. Um, but on the Al Mahajarun picture, um, it's quite interesting. So as I mentioned at the outset, we're talking about 43 plots uh, with 70 people. Um, of them, 12 of the plots had some link to Al-Mahajarun with 18 people within those 12 plots who were trying to uh, be, uh, you know, who are linked to the organization. Of that, about 16, you know, the majority of them linked to um, ISIS. So we had a lot of ALM links to ISIS. Al-Mahajarun, for those who don't know, is an organization in the United Kingdom that was established in the sort of 1990s, uh, founded by a man called Omar Bakri Muhammad. And it's really been described as kind of the core of the British uh, jihadist uh, terrorist uh, community. And it repeatedly shows up in terrorist plotting. Now, what's interesting actually is when we think about al Mahajarun within this context, it's actually not as overrepresented as one would expect. So when you look at other studies, they say that between 50% and 75% of UK terrorist attack planning has some links to al Mahajarun. Well, actually here, we can see that actually it's only about a quarter which I think speaks to something of how the group has sort of been attrited over time and really been reduced. Um, the ALM community is one that has had a lot of contact with security forces. So I think another issue that has sort of looked at there recently is the questions of recidivism about people who've been involved in terrorist activity, returning to terrorist activity, or people with criminal offenses becoming involved in terrorist activity. Well, actually that represents a pretty substantial part of uh, the cohort that we're talking about here. So if we look at uh, the cohort within the sort of uh, 43 plots, um, uh, seven, uh, um, uh, 43 plots involving 70 people, uh, we can see that of that, um, roughly uh, 21 of the individuals um, had some sort of prior terrorist conviction or had some sort of prior criminal conviction. Of that, 10 of them had uh, a sort of prior, uh, 10 of them were linked to um, al Mahajarun. So we're talking about the al Mahajarun being something that was very much focused on as, uh, you know, it shows up a lot. But what's interesting, it shows up a lot as people who've been convicted of previous criminal offenses or previous terrorist offenses. So if you look there, you can see that 10 of the Al-Mahajarunis had a previous criminal record, seven for terrorist activity, out of a total cohort of 21 and 10. So that shows that the ALM guys are quite heavily represented in those communities. On top of that, of the Al-Mahajarun community, at least nine had some previous contact with authorities um, than through the PREVENT program. Um, at least two of those, um, you know, th there's only two more amongst the group who had uh, the sort of total data set that I'm looking at, who had some sort of link, uh, who, who had been contacted by uh, the PREVENT program. Now, this sort of gives you a sense of the al Mahajarun, and I think it gives you a sense of the degree to which I think security forces are focused on them, but it doesn't necessarily show the degree to which they actually represent the entirety of the threat picture anymore. And the interesting other thing I would say is that the other point I wanted to make was to compare the al Mahajarun community with a community from West London. Now, I mentioned before a figure called Tariq Hassan, who'd been involved in one of the attacks that had been supposedly directed potentially from Syria and had some links to um, Syria. Now, Tariq Hassan appears in this picture up in the top. Now, he is part of a group of people that comes from a particular part of West London, which includes the infamous Jihadi John, who we can see um, in the bottom, Mohammed Mwazi. Now, this is a community of fighters who's been involved in sort of the, the pointy end, I would argue, of the British uh, jihadist threat picture going back a very long time. Um, in the bottom left of this sort of little map, you can see Mukta Saeed Ibrahim and Ramzi Mohammed, two of the individuals involved in the 21-7 bombing, which took place 15 years, well, two weeks from 15 years today. Um, there were also involved, uh, there was people from this community who ended up going to fight in Somalia and ended up quite prominent figures with Al-Shabaab. And this group also produces one of the terrorist attack plans that we see coming back from Syria and Iraq. Now, what's interesting is this is the only time this West London network shows up in the 43 plots that I'm talking about, which I think says something about 
Uh, and yet, if we look and we know, this is a group which is involved in jihadist activity repeatedly. A lot of these guys are still out in Syria. A lot of the ones pictured, um, if we look at Shokri al Akhfi or Muhammad al Araj, both of those guys are dead. Abdel Majid Bari, Abdel Bari, who you might not be able to see because I think my picture might be just on top of him. Um, he is an individual who was just arrested in Spain late last month. You know, so this Western London community has been um, kind of a really uh, a central point of the kind of British jihadist community, or the very serious British jihadist community, linking to battlefields in Afghanistan, Pakistan, linking to battles in Somalia, linking to battles in Syria um, for a long time. And yet, they just don't show up to the same degree as al Mahajarun does in the sort of public conversation around them, but also at the sharp end of the sort of attack planning. So I think some more thinking needs to go into how we sort of think about these kinds of networks in these communities. So now to touch on the lone actor side um, and to talk a little bit about the kind of other side of the threat picture that I think really represents the heart of the problem as it's currently seen. So I think when we're looking at the terrorist threat picture in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, when we're looking at the terrorist threat picture in the United Kingdom, um, in 25 of the cases that I identify, um, the individuals were prosecuted alone. And in 11 cases, they were talking to someone online. Um, so we're talking about a community of, you know, because when I say prosecuted alone, that doesn't always mean that they were necessarily operating alone. So in 11 of these cases, they were talking to someone online, but ultimately they ended up being prosecuted or launching the attack by themselves. And if we look further down uh, the picture, we can see in 14 of these cases, um, we had individuals who are acting totally alone. So lone actors without any clear links to other people. Um, in 11 cases, they had some links, but they were quite loose. Um, but of the 14 cases where people were actually acting alone, this counts for 10 of the attacks, which again is 13 of the total. So we can really see that this is where the heart of the sharp end of the spear really lies and the really pointy end of the threat. Um, almost all of these lone actors are male. Um, the two females that, were in, that you can sort of consider within this cohort um, were actually talking to other people online, um, including doing their sort of attack planning. So it's a very heavily sort of male phenomenon. Uh, in the women we have uh, are actually talking to people and actually they were talking to undercover officers online. So the whole side of that picture about whether we should consider these people, you know, lone actors or not, um, you know, ultimately they were kind of alone, but they weren't really because they were talking to someone. And so there's that whole line that really is quite flexible, fungible about, you know, about whether we should uh, think about these people as alone or parts of a sort of imagined network, even though actually they were really alone. And then the other aspect, which I think is quite important to note, is the fact that mental health issues, in particular paranoid schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorders, show up quite a lot um, in 10 of the lone cases and actually in two of the dyads, which brings you to another side of the picture, which is this question of, you know, my, my, the network I'm talking about, you know, as I said, it was 25 cases where we saw individuals who were sort of alone, um, but actually uh, of the other, uh, other, um, the other, the other, the, the rest of the cohort is made up of dyads or triads, or even in one or two cases, uh, a group of four, um, where we had a sort of cell involved of four people who were launching their attack. But what's interesting is when we look at the dyads, uh, which accounts for nine of the plots, um, in six of them, we were talking about family units, very close family units, so either cousins, or in most cases, it was brothers or husbands and wife. Um, and so when we're looking at this community of very sort of tight things. These dyads are often not connected to others either and don't have any evidence of direction. So really when we're talking about the lone side of the picture, we need to think about the lone side of the picture, not just involving isolated individuals, but also involving some of these very small family units. And I think that's an interesting side of the threat picture that needs to be sort of thought about a little bit more, how we're thinking about kind of loneliness. Um, it's no longer just the case that we should think about kind of loneliness necessarily as just as isolated individuals, but also isolated individuals who may be talking to others online, but have a sort of whole online life, but actually ultimately in real life are kind of alone, or very tight family units who are launching their attack. Which again goes back to the question about how we need to think about the questions of direction and networks. And networks don't really show up that much anymore in the terrorist attack planning. Um, of the, uh, the kind of mental health uh, side of the picture. As I said, five of the individuals were diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenics and five of them were uh, sufferers of autism spectrum disorders. Now, I think if we're thinking about the lone actor side of the picture, the other interesting thing to think about is that, um, that uh, lone actors in the UK are not totally new. 
but historically they've been quite rare. So we start to see them emerge in 2007, 2008, um, where we've, and we've had really uh, since, uh, uh, since that period, I think at least four where you've got a sort of individual who's trying to launch an attack alone. And then we've got one uh, successful, uh, well, two really successful loan after attacks, one in the United Kingdom and one abroad. So historically, it's something that hasn't shown up a huge amount, whereas now we can see it's really becoming the monster side of the threat picture. But then I think this is what brings me uh, to some of my concluding points, and I realize I, I've talked over my time, but, um, but I, I will go on anyway, because I think I've got your undivided attention for at least another, uh, another 40 or 50 minutes. Um, there is a really interesting question to think about within this sort of community of 43 people about the boundaries of what we're including as terrorism. And I think this boundary is articulated quite tightly through these, through a number of cases I want to talk about. And the first one is when we're thinking about paranoid schizophrenia. So here on this picture, I've got three individuals, um, isolated in the attacks that they tried to perpetrate, all of which involved knives, all of which involved them attacking random individuals. Um, the chap on, uh, the chap sort of by himself on the uh, uh, left of your screen is a chap called Muhyiddin Miri, who in December 2015 uh, start, tried to stab someone at Leighton's own tube station. Um, on the top, we have an individual whose face actually might be covered by mine, um, a chap called Nicholas Salvatore, who in 2013 uh, decapitated an old lady in North London um, and a cat. Um, and on the bottom, we have a chap called Mahdi Mohammed, who in December 2018 launched um, an attack on people uh, on New Year's Eve who were at Manchester Victoria Station. Now, these three individuals, um, two of them were ultimately you know, convicted of, of terrorist offenses. Um, one of them was not. Nicholas Salvatore was not. All three of them were diagnosed paranoid schizophrenics. Um, and all three of them had all sorts of issues. So in the case of Muhyiddin Mire, he uh, was a, a really quite a troubled individual whose family had tried to get uh, him uh, you know, to the attention of authorities. And they had actually been engaged with through mental health uh, at some points. He thought um, Tony Blair was his uh, guardian angel. Um, he was a, a very sort of troubled uh, a young man. Um, and he launched his attack. He was shouting about it being uh, in a response to Syria. Um, and he was definitely a sort of paranoid schizophrenic. Nicholas Salvatore, um, who launched his attack, was obsessed with the Jihadi John videos. He also, however, thought the person he murdered was an, an expression of Hitler. Um, so, you know, and he was, he was ultimately not convicted of terrorist offenses. Um, he was sort of sectioned because uh, the degree to which his lunacy has sort of articulated itself, it was concluded that he was completely out of, it, out of his wits. Um, and then at the bottom, Muhyiddin Mire was a young man who actually had a, a sort of barely respectable past, a managing an internship at the company Rolls-Royce, he was an engineer, and yet he also had this kind of obsession with conspiracies. He had an obsession with people controlling the mind and security services controlling him. And he'd written this manifesto um, called Neurotechnology, which he'd sent sort of repeatedly around the world. He'd sent it to all sorts of people. He tried to make contact with the uh, prominent jihadi cleric, uh, Abdullah El Faisal, trying to send it to him. But he was also apparently schizophrenic. Now, all three of these individuals launched terrorist attacks against random, random people using knives. They're included within it. They have no sort of link to any sort of articulated terrorist group, but they show up, you know, repeatedly in uh, the terrorist threat picture. And there are others who you could fit. The other side to the kind of boundaries of terror uh, uh, discussion I like to have is talk about three cases here. Anwar Said Druich, who's at the top for the, uh, the individual who is, again, whose face might, is slightly masked by mine. And then at the bottom, Ahmed Hassan on the right, who left a bomb in Parsons Green Underground Station uh, on a train in 2017. And Damon Smith, who did a similar thing uh, a year later on an underground now, Damon Smith wasn't prosecuted for terrorist offenses. He had all three of these individuals, there's some evidence of some sort of Asperger's uh, syndrome disorder. Um, Damon Smith, it was concluded, he hasn't even been included in some uh, discussions of terrorism, even though he had tried to convert to terrorism, that convert, sorry, to, uh, to Islam, but it wasn't clear that he had. He was carrying around a, a Quran with him all the time. He said he'd left a successful and attempted bomb on the underground as part of a prank. Um, but he had an obsession with bombs, and it goes back to when he was 10 years old. Um, Ahmed Hassan was a, a young man who came to the United Kingdom from Iraq. Um, he came in, claimed to be underage. He was living in foster care, and while he was living in foster care, he decided to launch his attack. He claimed that he had family members who died in Iraq. He claimed he'd actually been trained as a minor in Iraqi, uh, in ISIS camps. Uh, when he came to the United Kingdom, he told authorities this. He seems to be a case who slipped through uh, the boundaries, but it's also not clear that he was receiving any direction from, um, from ISIS. But he 
is an individual who very clearly had some sort of terrorist connection, to Anwar Druich, who was using uh, AQ material and using ISIS material, but actually uh, seemed more interested in just mass violence and seemed more interested actually in incel, in involuntary celibate uh, uh, activity. And my point with these three is to show how the lone actor side of the picture articulates itself also through bomb makers. All three of these guys were bomb makers. All three of them had kind of questions around Asperger's uh, syndrome, uh, dis I'm sorry, autism spectrum disorders. Um, and all three of them used or had a clear link to the kind of ismus ideology, but it's not clear that any of them had any direction. And again, this uh, shows how this kind of boundary of terrorism has really become very confused where well, we no longer have a sort of clear picture of terrorist plots being directed, um, but we now have this very confusing picture of these young men who launched these attacks uh, with clear links to the ideology or the material of, uh, of ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but without any uh, sort of clear direction. So I, I will stop there. You have my contact details. Uh, and I'd love to hear from anyone who's interested who doesn't maybe get to ask question now, but I'll hand it over now to Kumar, who I think is gonna moderate um, the question and answer session and I will stop sharing my screen. Oh, thanks, Raf. Uh, it's very interesting uh, presentation, very rich. Uh, lots of things to talk about. Uh, we had a bunch of questions uh, coming in right now. Uh, maybe to sort of set the context further for our discussion, which, and then we can sort of bring in some of these questions. Is, uh, when you look at the UK context like uh, Raf, uh, I, mean, I remember in the past reading about how some uh, analysts were referred to, particu particularly uh, after September 11, uh, and especially after the uh, July 7, 2005 attacks. Uh, London as Londonistan, right? Londonistan, right? So, so uh, why do you think uh, that term came about? And do you think that's still a fair assessment of the... Uh, environment, the threat environment in the, in the UK. We'll, we'll start with that and then we'll, we'll carry on. Sure. So, I mean, look, Londonistan uh, was a term that I think was coined in the 1990s uh, by French uh, uh, security sources who had uh, spoken about um, the fact that they noticed that a lot of the terrorist plots they were disrupting had some sort of uh, connection to, um, uh, to uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and they were particularly worried about the fact that there was some uh, preachers in the United Kingdom. Abu Qatada was the most prominent one, but there was also people like Abu Hamza, um, who basically were linked to the networks that were ultimately trying to launch attacks in France. So the French got very angry about this, um, and they got very angry about the fact that London had seemingly become a hub for international, uh, you know, jihadist community. Um, and the way of Aspresios was this coining of this term, Londonistan. Now, Londonistan, in a way, you know, was a reflection of a number of different historical trends, which I can, uh, uh, I'm not sure my video is actually uh, on at the moment. Uh, I, I, I think we might still be on, uh, we are, okay. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, my, my book that I wrote up there actually lays this out uh, quite conveniently. Uh, if you want to go and read a, a tidy history of this subject. But anyway, the point about London understand was London at the time was, uh, the UK is very open. It's got a long history of dissidents coming there. It also has a substantial kind of community, uh, Arab community uh, linked all over the world. And those individuals and that dissident community was everything from political dissidents all the way through to Islamist dissidents. And all these Islamist dissidents came to the United Kingdom and they established themselves there because the UK was just open and anyone could sort of move there. Also, it was quite well situated in terms of timings, in terms of links in the Middle East. Um, and also, frankly, the security services were more willing to watch these communities than actually disrupt them. And so that's where the Londonistan term actually came from. And so as a result, you can see a lot of plotting and talking of terrorism back in, uh, you know, the 2000s really does tie strings to the United Kingdom. Now, that phenomenon has been clamped down on considerably. Uh, the United Kingdom is no longer the same kind of hub because, frankly, a lot of those preachers are now in jail or have left the country. Now, they do still show up. You know, there are still kind of Londonistan links that exist, or what we call Londonistan. But again, the point about the terrorist threat picture in a way is that I think what we've seen in the United Kingdom is probably similar to what we've seen in lots of other places as well, which is the terrorist threat picture is no longer as hierarchical and structured as it was before, where you had a very kind of core, you know, group that was launching attacks abroad, that was directing people to do these things. You no longer have kind of preachers in the same way as significant. Instead, you've got a threat picture 
that is dominated, as I say, by these lone actors. Some of them have had contact with uh, these preachers. So, for example, the chap, um, Mahdi Muhammad, um, who I mentioned, who, who launched the attack on Victoria uh, Manchester train station, he was trying to send his manifesto to Abdullah El Faisal, uh, the Jamaican preacher who was part of the kind of London Islam community who was living in Jamaica at the time. He's now waiting extradition to the United States where the Americans are trying to prosecute him. So, you know, there is still an attempt to reach this community, but it's no longer as present in the UK. And it's also no longer significant in the same way that I would argue that it was um, before. Mm. Thanks, Rafa. Related, related to that is the, you know, the whole issue of, you know, listening to you uh, talking about the, uh, the profiles of some of the lone actor uh, terrorists, right? And particularly the, the fact that they seem to have uh, schizophrenic uh, episodes and mm -hmm. uh, backgrounds. Uh, this brings up the, the issue which, you know, a lot of analysts uh, grapple with. Uh, how important is extremist ideology in this picture? I mean, are these guys getting radicalized because of the extremist ideology, uh, that is Islamist or extreme right wing? Or is it more a factor of their mental health, right? I mean, uh, this is an issue which, of course, uh, has come to the fore in uh, recent times. So based on your analysis of the, at least the UK situation, uh, what, what would you think about that? So, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, as I, as I tried to show, this question of mental health, autism spectrum disorders, shows up uh, quite frequently, frankly, and increasingly frequently um, in, in this sort of period. Now, it has to be said, I haven't done detailed analysis of what looked what it looked like before. So it's possible that actually it was there before, we just weren't sort of looking for it and observing it. And I haven't gone back and done the historical digging which would be required to identify that. So that's a caveat to add. Um, inside to this question is of course, what I'm looking at here is very much the sharp end of the sphere. So plots that are being disrupted, either when an actual plot is being attempted or when an attack's been perpetrated. What I'm not looking at is all of the other disruptions that take place. And of course, there's a question about whether over time, you know, security forces will get better at understanding the threat that they're looking at and will get better at knowing how to disrupt it. So it's possible actually that there are a lot more plots out there that have just been disrupted at a much earlier stage. So while we can see more of the, so my point to say is that, you know, it's possible that the ideology still is quite important, but it's just not showing up at the sharp end of the spear or the sharp end of the threat, because what we're seeing get to the sharp end of the threat is the part that maybe is less connected ideologically to, uh, to the kind of, uh, you know, the bigger network. So bigger kind of network plots. I mean, I've heard stories of cases where people who were linked very, to very, very serious individuals in um, Syria and Iraq have been disrupted um, for non-terrorism offenses, for example, um, who've been disrupted in plots where there was no evidence actually presented in court that they were trying to do an attack. But I've spoken to people who've said to me, yeah, he was planning to do, you know, that guy was up to something and we just didn't know exactly what, but the plot was disrupted at such an early stage or the security services decided not to use that information ultimately in prosecution that we just don't know about it. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a thing to think about where we're thinking about the degree to which, you know, what we're seeing articulating in attacks is more mental health, is more lone actors, is more people with autism spectrum disorders, is more people where, as I tried to show with my last slides, the kind of the bleed of, um, ideology is really confusing where we can see elements of you know jihadist thinking and you know we can see evidence of trying to tap some of those ideologies but we can also see them pulling in a lot of other stuff um an interesting thing that we've seen over the past i think it's the past two years um the home office when it releases its uh its sort of figures terrorism figures of terrorist figures around terrorist offenses that they prosecuted over the previous year. Over the past two years, they've included a new subset within it of the ideologies that is called mixed, unstable, or unclear. And what this is, is really a basket of people where you've got clear evidence they were trying to do a terrorist attack, but it's not clear which ideology they were using. Because mm -hmm. when you look at their sort of hard drives, you find some incel stuff, you find some Islamist stuff, you even find some far extreme right wing stuff. It's a real mix of ideologies together. And the individuals seem to bring these all together and try to do an attack. So where do we classify them? And do we say that these people are ideologically drawn or are they people who are kind of looking for something and they find it and this, this is part of it? Um, you know, to say what I, to, to give you a sense of what I'm actually talking about in terms of actual attacks, 
you may remember in 2018, there was an individual, um, a Sudanese migrant to the United Kingdom who tried to drive into people who are outside parliament. Um, he drove his car into them. He injured, I think, two people. Now, his case is interesting because he was prosecuted ultimately for terrorism, but the prosecuting judge, you know, in his summation remarks, or not the judge in the, pros you know, in the case, in his summation remarks said, you know, I can't tell what your ideology was. There, there was no evidence actually of any Islamists there, but he clearly tried to do a driving terrorist attack. Um, and this is showing up increasingly on the kind of sharp end of the spear. And so we're seeing more of these cases show up. Um, and it's quite confusing because the ideology around them is very unclear and opaque. Um, it draws on some Islamist stuff, but it also draws on others. Um, and we're seeing questions around mental health showing up a lot more. So what does this mean? You know, there is uh, a number of, you know, I'll offer some off the cuff thoughts, explanations around it. There is one which is just that, uh, you know, uh, what, you know, if we think about the noise around terrorist attacks, you know, the amount of attention they attract, um, that is quite attractive maybe to a disorganized mind. I mean, individuals who are looking for some sort of way of showing or drawing attention to themselves while doing what a terrorist attack is a good way of doing that in a way, right? If you're an angry person, you've got something happening in your life, you can do that. And you can do an attack against other people um, just using a car or just using knives and it will get interpreted as a terrorist attack. And so it brings greater meaning to your sort of expression of anger. So that's sort of one potential explanation, uh, or one potential sort of uh, idea I, I could offer. The other is uh, the question of um, uh, social media and the question of the internet and how ideas live on the internet now. Um, mm. Because there, I think a lot of this question around sort of ASD sufferers in particular, ASD sufferers tend to be obsessive personalities. The internet is a great place or a dangerous place, frankly, for obsessive personalities. You can really get yourself into rabbit holes. And we see that in other ideologies as well. If we think of QAnon, if we think of sort of some of the other extreme right wing ones, we can see that you've got people who are really kind of getting wrapped up in ideas, can really go down rabbit holes online and ultimately connect with other people to ultimately get the idea of trying to launch an attack. So those are just two kind of uh, ideas I'd offer. So where does ideology fit into all that? Well, I think it gives these people something to connect with, uh, but it, what it doesn't necessarily mean is they necessarily mm. understand or believe what they're doing. That's that, uh, yeah, no, that's a, I mean, uh, it is a uh, complex issue. Uh, and uh, I mean, someone here, just uh, Jared and Casey mentioned that uh, perhaps based on our discussion, uh, it could be, I mean, would you, uh, in your view, assess that, you know, uh, terrorism, at least lone actor terrorism is just a subset of a bigger mental health issue? Could it be seen that way, policy-wise, policy implication-wise? I mean, I think, yes, uh, frankly, there is, a, there is a real question in my mind around that, you know, and I think that that's why, at least in the United Kingdom, I know there's been a lot of focus on this question. Um, the chap I mentioned, Mahudin Mire, who, uh, who did the stabbing at Lakenstone Underground uh, uh, Station in, in 2015, his case is an interesting one because it was a bit of a turning point in the kind of British counterterrorism thinking. After that, they decided to really focus in on this question because they really started to question about whether they had a good grasp on what was going on. And um, so this is in 2015. And after that, you see them starting to create, um, or you see them starting to create, you see them championing, they're already kind of organically happening on the ground, what they call vulnerability hubs, which are basically centers that are uh, focused at the moment, I think there's three, one in London, one in Manchester, one in Birmingham, where essentially they bring together uh, mental health practitioners, uh, nurses, uh, security forces and police, um, to basically look at some cases. And the idea is that they will look at, you know, potential investigations emerging at someone who's shown up on the security services radar or shown up as a prevent case. They will look at these cases and they will say, well, what is this guy? You know, is he really a terrorist? You know, is he really going down that path? Is he a prevent case that we can handle in some other way? Or is there a real mental health issue here that we need to address? Um, and so there is an attempt already to try to do that. And they're trying to do that by creating these hubs to try to process cases before uh, they ultimately become attacks. The idea being that maybe if you can kind of catch them earlier, you can steer them more in a mental health solution direction rather than it being counterterrorism. Because the other side to this question, which of course is worth thinking about is, you know, is it a good use of, you know, resource for the security services to be spending their time chasing crazy people around essentially, you know? 
Um, the security services have a very difficult job. They're a very expensive tool. You know, there's lots of other threats out there they need to worry about. Should their, you know, task list be consumed with mental health patients, you know? And so there's a real question around that that needs to be sort of thought about. And I think it is a very valid question about whether we need to think about it uh, uh, more in that case. You know, having said all of this, the point I want to emphasize is that, of course, this doesn't mean the classic terrorist threat picture has gone away. I would just suspect the security service has got very good at managing that at this point, which is why it's not showing up as much. But I think more resource does need to be deployed. And the idea of engaging mental health or finding ways of bringing thinking around healthcare provision or healthcare services into the kind of response is, I think, uh, important to look at. Sure. A couple of questions here uh, kind of uh, flows out from uh, this discussion we just had about prevent, right? The prevent program. I mean, uh, as we know, uh, it's been uh, seen in some quarters as uh, rather controversial. Uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, the program is often presented, I mean, it's seen as unfairly profiling, stigmatizing certain groups, and in this process, inadvertently feeding radicalization and therefore actually is counterproductive? Uh, or, or what do you think about that? I mean, prevent, you know, has been uh, a sort of fixation for people for a long time. Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll digress very briefly to give you, you know, what actually is prevent. <laughs> and I think this is a key thing because, you know, prevent as a concept comes about um, in, uh, in the wake of 9-11 when a very prominent British uh, security official called Sir David Oman uh, wrote the British Counterterrorism Strategy Contest. Now, when he wrote the British Counterterrorism Strategy, you know, like a good bureaucrat, he basically said, okay, we need to organize bureaucracy. And if you organize bureaucracy, you need to give it kind of pillars and structure. And so his idea was the counterterrorism strategy needs four pillars. He identified four baskets of issues that were going to be needed to address the terrorist threat picture that the United Kingdom saw it was going to be facing from violent Islamist terrorism. And that was the four Ps. And that was prepare, pursue, protect, and prevent. What do they all mean? Pursue is classic counterterrorism, chasing bad guys, disrupting plots. Prepare is getting the public ready. It's kind of resilience. It's about getting society ready so that when a terrorist attack comes, you can respond to it and get back to normality as quickly as possible. And protect is kind of the mechanics, if you will, of counterterrorism in the sense of, you know, it's basically making sure buildings have shatterproof glass uh, so that if a bomb goes off, it won't, you know, you know, when bombs go off, more people tend to get hurt and maimed by the exploding, by the glass that fragments around rather than actually the device itself. Um, so, you know, make sure buildings have that. Make sure bollards are placed in front of public locations so that if someone's driving a car bomb, they can't get it in. You know, that's protect. And then finally, prevent, which is basically saying, so we've done all the mechanical parts of how to respond to a terrorist attack. How do we try to get ahead of the picture and stop terrorism actually happening in the first place? And that's prevent. Now, of course, that's the hardest part <laughs> because what you're doing is you're trying to stop you know, an ideology, you're trying to stop people's mental processes of being drawn towards an ideology, you know? And that is why Prevent has always been the most complicated of all of them, because in a way, there's many different reasons why people become terrorists, right? Um, reams of ink have been spilled saying how, you know, uh, how, how in many ways, there's as many narratives to radicalization as there are people who've been radicalized. So if you take that as true, <laughs> how on earth are you going to formulate a policy that's going to respond to that? You know, you're, gonna, you're talking about something incredibly complicated. So prevent, but prevent was trying to do that. And so prevent has always been something that has been very complicated. Now the problem has been also that when prevent has ultimately articulated itself, it's tended to be basically shelling money towards Muslim communities or shelling money towards organizations that were working in Muslim communities. It was very focused in that direction. And so it became very much like a kind of targeting exercise. And the truth of the matter is that even if we take the upper numbers of estimates of people who've been involved or interested in Islamist ideas in the United Kingdom, you're still talking about low tens of thousands, right? Over a 30 year time period. For a Muslim community that at the moment, I think is about three or 4 million strong. So you're talking about a fraction and yet you're pouring all this attention, all this negative attention. And that is why Prevent, I think gets got a lot of bad attention. From my perspective, whenever I've looked at Prevent programs, there, have, there were a lot of problems, I think, in the early days of Prevent, where basically government was just kind of pushing money out of the door to anyone who showed up and said, oh, I have a Prevent answer, just because they needed something. Um, to today, where actually it's a much more kind of nuanced picture, where actually it's trying to help you know, schools develop uh, curricula and develop things to try to help uh, kids, help teachers have the tools to be able to you know, tell kids what not to do. But it still has a very bad image. 
and it still continues to cause problems. And I think there's a big prevent review happening at the moment or planned at the moment. They're just recruiting a sort of chair for it. And after that, we're going to see, I think, some, some fundamental changes. From my perspective, I think the problem I have with prevent is that it tries to go so far upstream that it's very hard to define, uh, I think, when they're looking at terrorism or when they're not. And so the question would be, I think, a lot of what probably is the upstream prevent work, the stuff which is stopping people you know, at what we describe as the root causes of why ultimately they end up as terrorists, um, it's actually probably stuff we should be doing in our societies anyway. You know, our schools should be well-funded. Our social services should be well-funded. We should have systems in place to deal with people with mental health issues. We should have systems to help people. You know what I mean? Those should already be happening. I don't think we should have to flag them as a counter-terrorism program for government to do them. So I think that's really what it's got to be about. You know, and I think if we're able to do that, then there's a question in my mind about whether prevent in some ways that aspect of prevent should be peeled away. The final point I make on this is that it's important to remember that even if we peel all of that stuff away, so we kind of take away the non, the, the very upstream elements of prevent and say, we're no longer going to call this prevent. It's just going to, we're going to fund better <laughs> the social service provisions which should be doing those jobs. There is still an aspect of prevent which is important, which is around de-radicalization, which is around handling sort of former prisoners, uh, which is about trying to get some of those people online. And that is still important. I think that has also actually been historically very underfunded um, and been beset with problems. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot more focus on that. And in particular, looking at stuff like probation services, which again, uh, are under a huge amount of pressure to manage some of these cases, um, but just don't get the resource to do it. So I think when we're focused on prevent, I think, yes, it's got a very bad image. And I think after this review, we're going to probably see a lot of rhetoric around changing it. I think from my perspective, a lot of what has been done as prevent before, frankly, should be stuff that we should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that's left is actually still quite important. Maybe we just need to rebrand it as DRAD or counter, or, you know, DRAD instead or something. Mm -hmm. So you so perhaps don't even call some of these activities prevent, right? Just Yeah. Just, but you uh, see, the difficulty is that the reason they had to get called prevent in the first place was because they weren't happening. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's the key question we have to think about a little bit more. Uh, we need to look at a little bit more thoughtfully. So, for example, I remember in the early days of Prevent, some of the stories I'd heard about programs that were getting funding as Prevent were, you know, there was one particular case where someone said to me, there was a school up in, in, the, in the Midlands, in the West Midlands, in a sort of majority Muslim community, where basically the teacher had uh, wanted to take the kids to the zoo, so she'd apply for Prevent funding to do this. And she'd taken them to the zoo, and on the way back in the bus, she said to the kid, yeah, basically, don't be terrorists. Okay, now go about your daily business. Essentially, she was, she'd realized she wasn't going to get funding to do this trip she wanted to do. Um, and so she cleverly, one could argue, <laughs> you know, manipulated the system to get it. But there was a lot of stories like that, where basically you had sort of programs that really the link to actual terrorism was very loose. But it was clearly funding that, you know, they needed funding in these places. And they were just having to manipulate the system in that way. So I think that's kind of the key, is that we need to think a little bit about what it was uh, that was getting prevent funding and whether that should have been happening anyway. For example, mental health services. We should have well-funded mental health services. <laughs> it shouldn't require this for mental health services to get better funding. You know? And so that's, I think, the answer to the question in a way. That's a fair point. Uh, you know, recently, and I think this should be uh, brought up, uh, uh, I think late last year, there was a commission on uh, extremism, right? And uh, I think led by uh, Ms. Sarah Khan, the commissioner, and they came up, uh, this commission came up with a document on defining hateful extremism, right? Uh, I mean, what is your assessment of this uh, initiative? Do you think it's important and do you think it's uh, uh, going to make a, a good policy impact? What's your, what's your view? So, I mean, the Commission on Counter Extremism was something that came out of, uh, it, it was a Tory government uh, uh, decision. And the idea was that, um, you know, the problem becomes if you're looking at terrorism and you're trying to understand how to stop it, um, you often look towards the ideas that tie all these people together for quite understandable reasons. The ideologies often are quite important, though, as I think I've shown, it's not always that important in the individual cases. But if you can tackle the ideology, like, what do you define as the ideology? And the ideology can encompass a number of different things. So it can encompass, you know, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, very clearly terrorist ideologies, terrorist groups. But then you've got sort of groups that in some discourse come before that. Groups like Hizb al-Tahrir. Um, groups like, you know, various Salafi jihadi organizations. 
or Salafi organizations even. Or in the United Kingdom, there's a huge Deobandi community, for example, a very conservative South Asian articulation, which in a South Asian context is often linked very heavily to, um, uh, to uh, jihadist communities in, in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You know, what do you, but these are basically very conservative uh, religious movements but we see individuals sort of going on a journey sometimes through these movements and these groups, ultimately to the jihadist end of the picture. Now, the question is, where do you draw that line? Where do you draw that line of saying, what is terrorist versus what is just extreme ideology? And it's very difficult sometimes to draw that line. And often my arguments, always, my thoughts always been that where you draw that line often is uh, an expression in some ways of where you sit on the political spectrum. Um, and you can see that, you know, if we've got a spectrum that on one hand has hardcore uh, jihadists and on the other end of the spectrum has, you know, basically uh, uh, Muslims and there's kind of a, a spectrum in between of degrees of conservatism, degrees of interest in some of the ideas that mesh with what groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda are talking about, you know, interest in the implementation or forcing down of Sharia law. You know, it's, it's a very kind of fungible thing. And then also to express itself in terms of anger against government or um, anger against uh, Jewish communities or other minority communities, the Ahmadis, for example. There's a Ahmadi community in the UK. They're often targeted by some of these more conservative uh, uh, Muslim sects in the United Kingdom. So it's a very kind of confusing picture. And the idea of the commission of counter-extremism was to try to move it a little bit upstream, to try to think not just about the terrorists and the jihadists, to say they're over on this side of the coin. We need to deal with this side of the coin as well. So how do we deal with this side of the coin? And so the commission of counter-extremism has been trying to focus on that aspect. Um, the difficulty, I think, is that that work that the Commission is doing is very close to what a lot of work that happens within the Home Office. Uh, there's a whole extremism unit there as well. Um, it's also not entirely clear that they've managed to really define in a way that is kind of useful in the sense that's prosecutable um, what exactly extremism means. And also, it bleeds into lots of other ideologies as well, so the extreme right. The commission has done a lot of work on the extreme right as well, um, on trying to understand how that's, uh, you know, showing up. Um, but the point is, in many ways, that the commission is um, exploring a lot of these ideas. But in a way, it's very difficult uh, to see, frankly, how it's going to come up with any perfect answers. Because, you know, there's an argument then to be made about whether we should be thinking about the kind of extremist community which might just be conservative expressions or fundamentalists who aren't necessarily terrorists or violent. Um, should we really be thinking about them in the same way as terrorism? Shouldn't we have a clearer kind of break between the two? Um, and this really goes into the kind of bigger questions about the United Kingdom and society. And this whole idea of the UK being a multicultural society where basically you can come, you can be whoever you want, uh, as long as it doesn't kind of, you know, attack or interfere others, uh, then basically you can kind of crack on. Um, but the question is, there is a discourse, uh, quite a strong political discourse, and the commission expresses that, that actually we need to address some of the issues that those communities raise as well about the fact that they are trying to live kind of isolated um, lives. They are, uh, you know, forcing down implementation of Sharia law in their own kind of particular communities. You know, there are issues there that a certain community, and people very close to the government at the moment, think should be addressed. And those people should kind of be dragged into kind of more mainstream society. Um, and so it's a very complicated picture. I don't really have a clean answer to this, Kumar, as I'm sure you can tell. I'm kind of talking in the circle, talking in circles okay. slightly no, here. But, no but I think the point is the commission was really an articulation of trying to deal with that problem of having a spectrum of ideas. And some of the work they've done has been very interesting in terms of identifying some of the hateful ideologies that are out there, in terms of identifying and calling some of them out and drawing some attention to them, which is useful in then trying to give people in those communities tools to try to respond to them. But I think at the end of the day, it's difficult for me to see that the commission is going to be able to absolutely resolve the issues that in some ways it was able to uh, express, because I'm not sure that unless you're going to really develop a draconian society, you're going to be able to legislate against some of these questions. Right. No, that's fair. That's, that's fine. It's a complex issue. Just want to hear some of your thoughts. Uh, some of the questions here, uh, uh, one just came in. Uh, as we know, the UK is a multi-diaspora country, and are there any variations in radicalization patterns among different migrant communities? Uh, in other words, do you think that some community, migrant communities are more susceptible to extremism than others, in, based on the UK example? Um, thank you. That's an interesting question. I think, um, 
in the in the community I'm I'm talking about here, uh, the um, it's it's pretty uh, broad actually and pretty diverse in terms of individuals who are ultimately involved in the attacks. I think what might be slightly uh, that's not really actually. So broadly speaking, the British Muslim community is made up overwhelming majority is South Asian, um, with about fifty percent. Uh, links to Pakistan, uh, about another 20% have links to Bangladesh, and then the last 30% is made up of a mix of uh, Arab and Muslim countries, um, a little bit South Asian, really not very big, um, uh, and some African uh, uh, Muslims and um, Indian. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite a broad mix. So that's broadly how it breaks down. And then about 10% or less than 10% of the British Muslim community are converts. If you look at the kind of terrorist threat picture, it broadly speaking matches that pattern, where the overwhelming majority is South Asian, uh, the breakdown between Pakistani and Bangladeshi, uh, or Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin, the point to emphasize is an awful lot of them aren't actually recent migrants, often second or third generation. Um, it's quite diverse. There's maybe a few more Pakistani than Bangladeshi, but it's actually quite broadly, it broadly tracks it. The one community which appears to be overrepresented in the attack plotting versus in the broader community is the convert community. Um, converts show up more in attack planning that or terrorism involved in general than they do in the kind of broader community. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons potentially for that. You know, converts have a, a zeal. You know, they tend to go to the more extreme expression. They sometimes tend to go to the more extreme expression of the religion. They're keen to show, to prove that they're real Muslims. And so they're more willing to be accepting these sorts of ideas. But when we think about the immigrant side and the diaspora communities, it actually I've always found tends to broadly track uh, what we see in the broader community. The wrinkle I would add uh, to some of the more recent cases that we've seen of attack planning, which is interesting or something I think to think about and to dig into a little bit more, is the degree to which we've seen individuals actually involved in attacks over the past few years um, who come from uh, war-torn countries. Um, who And so there's a question around post-traumatic stress. It's not always clear that that means they necessarily have links to terrorist groups, by the way, but what it does mean is that they have got linked to a battlefield or they have seen sort of violence firsthand. And so I think that raises some questions um, around them. I think that's an interesting wrinkle that we've seen maybe express itself more recently uh, than we have in the past, but I haven't quite got the data to prove that yet. And if we go back and think to uh, uh, 2005 and the attacks that we saw then, of course, the second plot that we saw on 21-7, where we had basically an echo of the plot on 7-7. Um, the individuals were majority from Eritrea, uh, Somalia, and East Africa, um, and all of them had fled uh, the sort of conflict there. So it's not totally new, frankly, that we see communities from a war-torn country showing up at the sharp end of this bit. All right. Uh, maybe a slight change of tech, a couple of uh, perhaps a bit more technical questions. Uh, uh, this question from uh, Mr. Uh, Marcelo. Uh, considering the three C's, criminal, crazy, crusader, three C's, right? Criminal, crazy, crusader. The difference between crazy and crusader is a very thin line. So the question is, does the British justice system accept the crazy defense uh, argument uh, so that the suspect is not prosecuted as a terrorist or the guy was crazy? So, it, it, I mean, don't prosecute him. So uh, what do you think about that? I mean, I mean look, I think... As I, as I pointed out in, in the community that I, I highlighted, you had, you know, <clears throat> five cases of paranoid schizophrenics who were convicted, you know, uh, five cases with autosexual. And in a lot of the other cases, it is true, a criminal defense will often use a mental health question as part of the defense. You know, it is, it is an obvious one for defendants to recourse to. Um, and so that does confuse it a little bit. Because, of course, when you're looking at the cases, sometimes you can see, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, the crazy being cited by the defense. But, yeah, there's no evidence for it. Now, the point I would make around this is that um, the cases where you have seen, you know, in terms of your question about the British justice system, the British justice system will accept that defense if it holds up to psychiatrist scrutiny. So if the individual, you know, is out of their mind, they are prosecuted, um, and they are seen by a psychiatrist before, the psychiatrist looks at them and goes, yep, this one is certifiable. Um, they will get sectioned uh, under the Mental Health Act and put into a secure prison rather than uh, just a prison, a sort of secure mental health unit prison rather than uh, just a prison. So it is a, a, 
it is used often by defendants, um, but it's only successful when the individual has actually been um, you know, certified. So the other point I make is that even in some cases where people have been certifiably defined as paranoid schizophrenic, and I think in my slide uh, showing uh, uh, the three uh, knife men, um, those, uh, you know, those two cases, Mahdi Muhammad and Mehdi you Mira, know, they were both certifiable and they were both the uh, section, <laughs> you know, and yet they were both prosecuted for terrorism offenses. So you know, it's not, one doesn't necessarily mean that the justice system will completely exclude the other. It often comes down to the particular judge or the particular case. Hmm. Uh, another technical question uh, uh, relates to terrorism financing. Uh, I guess to just to, uh, maybe to context contextualize this, uh, these questions. Uh, how important would you think the money trail is to understand the evolution of the terrorist threat in the UK nowadays? If, if you talk about the, the rise of a uh, lone actor terrorism, I mean, uh, money, money trail, is it as important as, you know, when you're talking about organized terrorist networks? So, mm -hmm. so what is your mm -hmm. question? So I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think uh, others uh, are, are specialists on uh, terror financing, so I tend not to look at it. But my sense of terror financing is I have struggled often to find it as a particularly pertinent indicator of the threat picture. Um, because when I think about just the United Kingdom cases, so if we think back to the July 7 plotters, for example, um, they were self-financed. You know, they did their financing for their terrorist activity through fraud. Um, they, one of them, I think a couple of them ripped off their student loans. Um, others basically did this thing where they would go and rent um, heavy equipment uh, you know, like uh, drills or power tools. And then they would just sell them on eBay and then take the money. And they would burn through credit cards. They would run up overdrafts and then you know, we're going to do it again. You know, so that was how they funded that plot. And that was an organized Al Qaeda plot linked to the United Kingdom, you know? Mm. Um, so where does terrorist, how's terrorist financing relevant for that kind of discussion? You know, the successful attack had no evidence of it particularly, right? There were other attacks during that period that did have evidence of Al Qaeda sending large sums of money um, or basically keeping people on stipend. Um, more recently, I would argue that I struggle to think of any of the plots that I've looked at where terrorist financing was a determinant in what the individual was doing, as in terrorist financing from external groups. In almost every single case, I suspect, I would argue, that they were basically funding themselves or using their own tools. The other side to this coin is when we think about attack planning and we think about knives and cars being what people are using or fake bombs, which is basically taking, you know, empty plastic bottles and wrapping them around yourself. These are not expensive tools. These are cheap tools. And so, again, where is the sort of salience of terror financing within that? So I, I question a little bit uh, the relevance of terror financing in terms of understanding the terrorist threat picture in the United Kingdom, at least. Of course, in other places, this may be very different. And of course, I would say that there are, it is likely that you did see some money kind of bouncing back and forth in some cases. Um, oftentimes, I think more often you see cases of people from the United Kingdom sending money to people in Syria and Iraq to support the activity that they're doing there. Right. Um, one of the issues which, of course, is very uh, significant now is the, the comparison of uh, extreme right-wing uh, terrorism and Islamist uh, terrorism. I mean, uh, in your view, uh, have we come to the point where we see uh, extreme right-wing terrorism become uh, as great a threat as uh, Islamist uh, terrorism in the UK? Well, I mean, look, I would, um, I, I think this is, this is, of course, the hot question at the moment in many ways. You know, the extreme right-wing is everyone's perception of the kind of the new threat. I mean, as I, I think I briefly mentioned in my presentation, it's been present in the United Kingdom going back to the 1990s. You know, I uh, did uh, uh, an interview with um, Jonathan Evans, the former head of MI5, uh, for the CTC Sentinel earlier this year. And in it, he talked about cases that his service had worked on in the 1990s, where they'd worked with the police to disrupt networks of extreme right-wingers in the UK linked to Combat 18, who were talking with counterparts in Eastern Europe about launching an attack. You know, mm -hmm. So that goes back to the 1990s. In 1999, we have the case of David Copeland, who did his one-man bombing campaign against minority communities in London. Um, throughout the noughties, uh, the sort of 2000s, you see occasional right-wing plots show up. They tend to be isolated individuals. 
they tend to, in, in, a lot of, in a surprisingly high number of cases, actually they get picked up for um, child uh, pornography, pedophilic material content was why the police sort of look at them in the first place. And then when they go kick down the door, they discover all this, you know, Nazi memorabilia and bombs. And, oh my God. You know, but originally they thought there was an individual, they were looking for a completely different case. Um, it tends to be that, that kind of tends to be the threat picture throughout the 2000s of the extreme right wing. In 2012, you know, tw the early 2010s, you see this start to change. And the English Defense League first emerges, um, which is basically an angry group of people in the United Kingdom who start to organize big marches because they're angry at what al Mahajirun in particular was doing in Luton. And this kind of grows into a big community around the United Kingdom, which is basically a kind of anger from white communities about against Islam. And, you know, other countries had sort of Pegida and other things, but that was in the UK context. Um, we also see through the experience the British National Party, uh, a very far right British political party starts to get a lot of attention and, and, and movement. And that becomes kind of more organized right wing. And then in 2013, we see a group called National Action Emerge, which is kind of where you see the terrorists, an organized terrorist group, start to come together on the extreme right. It's made up mostly of teenagers. It's interesting because they use a lot of the iconography and rhetoric of Islamists. So they talk about white jihad. They talk about, you know, the same kind of stuff that Islamists do, about doing the same kind of stuff that Islamists do. They're very clearly inspired by ISIS. A lot of their videos very look like ISIS videos. A lot of their imagery is very reminiscent of kind of ISIS and uh, uh, what ISIS was putting in 2013-14. Um, and so they're kind of copying each other. And that becomes kind of quite worrying. We start to see really a more organized right wing showing up. Um, we have the murder, of course, of uh, the MP Joe Cox in 2016. Um, and then in 2017, we had a couple of car ramming attacks um, by uh, far right wingers. But I think the key point I make about the extreme right wing is notwithstanding this sort of escalating concern presence, becoming more organized in the British context, showing more links abroad uh, to Central Eastern Europe in particular, even some rumors of individuals going to fight in battlefields like Ukraine. And within a broader European context, we can see how, you know, we've got training camps for right wingers happening now in Russia, uh, in Ukraine, in other parts of sort of Central Eastern Europe. You know, there is a kind of more organized right wing coming together across Europe, and it is showing up a little bit in the United Kingdom. But notwithstanding all of that, and I would argue there is a trajectory that you can see there of escalating concern, uh, look at Neil Basu's statements around what his police service are focused on, what his officers are looking at. And he still says that, you know, 10% of their workload is made up of the extreme right wing. 90% is something else, <laughs> with the majority being Islamist. And I think that gives you a sense of the degree to which the extreme right wing has escalated as a problem quite clearly. It's the fastest growing side of the threat. The security service, MI5, is dedicating more resource towards dealing with it. But it is still... Uh, only accounts for about 10% of the threat picture. The only final point I have about that, which is an interesting data point to consider, is that we've seen, so in the UK, they have a kind of, a, the, the security service and police have a threat matrix, which kind of looks at all the plots that they're looking at. I think over the past year or so, um, the story I heard was that apparently a far right guy did manage to get to the top of that. Um, so far right plots are escalating in concern. They're showing evidence of organization but they are still only 10% of the threat picture. I think that's an important thing to remember because there's always a danger in talking up threats, um, exacerbating the problem, <laughs> you know? And I think we always have to kind of consider that and, and, and bear that in mind. Anyway, thank you. Sure. Uh, perhaps uh, time for our final question, uh, which, well, okay, I think we covered most of it, but perhaps to, to wrap up, you know, it's a, I, I mean, it's up to you whether you want to, uh, are very comfortable answering this because I, I don't know whether you have looked at the anti the new anti terrorism law in the Philippines. Mm. Uh, would you want to have any uh, view on this? Uh, did you follow that? Uh, I did a bit. Yes, I have followed this. Um, it's uh, I know there has been a lot of concern around about it. Um, I think you know uh, I, I'm trading slightly out of an area that I know in a huge amount of detail. So apologies in advance for mistakes or rather that I make, they are entirely my own. The point I would make about uh, anti-terrorism legislation is that I think if one was to look in detail at the legislation that was being drafted in the Philippines, um, I would argue that it probably, uh, there are elements of it that are very similar to legislation you'd find in Western countries um, or in other countries as well. The problem around terrorist legislation is in who is delivering it. And I think that is really where the fundamental issue lies. So 
you can create all sorts of tools and governments can create all sorts of tools to deal with terrorist problems. It's then up to the government and the legislature that is working in that country to ensure that those are delivered to a high standard and they're delivered with openness and they're delivered with, uh, you know, with, um, with a due process involved. I think the danger and the difficulty, I think, with the Philippines in particular, is that what this new legislation does, it gives a lot of tools and power to government and to the security forces. And as we've seen historically, unfortunately, that power has not always been used for, uh, for good. Um, and I think that is fundamentally where the problem lies here. Um, you know, colleagues uh, or uh, listeners from the Philippines might wildly disagree with me, but I think that is really where the fundamental problem lies. It's in who is delivering this legislation. You can see a similar discourse happening in China now as well, or in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, Hong Kong needs a national security law of some sort. Everyone needs a national security law. The problem, again, is how much do you trust the government and the legislature that's behind that government or with that government and its, and its independence to actually deliver the law in a way that is open and transparent? Or how much do you think that government's going to manipulate it and use it to advance its own political goals? And I think there... That is really where the problem lies. And I think that is what, um, what the challenge is. Thank you. All right, thanks, Raf. Uh, well, we've had a very good and uh, rich uh, conversation uh, this entire uh, 1.5 hours. And uh, I'm sure our colleagues in the webinar will agree that uh, you know, we've had a very good session. So with that, uh, thanks very much, uh, Raf, for your sharing your thoughts. Uh, thanks very much to colleagues in the, who joined us for uh, today's webinar. Uh, and that just leaves me to uh, wish all of you a very good uh, day today and uh, please have a very good uh, rest of the week. So with that, uh, thank you very much and uh, see you at the next webinar.